As soon as videotape left the factory, it already started to break down. Information that is on the tapes is slowly dying, and if we don't preserve them, important historical content that's contained on them will be lost forever. What is MePOPS? What is MePOPS? What is MePOPS? MePOPS stands for Moving Image Preservation of Puget Sound. What MePOPS does for the general public of the Pacific Northwest is provide access to digitized content. Our mission is to raise awareness about the magnetic media crisis, the alarm that the Association of Moving Image Archivists sounded to sort of bring awareness to the urgency of digitizing videotape. Audiovisual Archive in Australia has put a deadline of 2025 to say if you don't have your magnetic material digitized by this time, you're, you're screwed. They're figuring out the actual date and it's right around the corner. Within 20 to 30 years of the time it's created, it's, it's disintegrating. The magnetic media crisis is sometimes called a gathering storm because the deterioration of the actual analog videotapes and then the increasing obsolescence and rarity of the players that play them back. So video is a little bit different from film in that video went through all these different iterations, all these different formats for consumer purposes, for broadcast purposes, whereas film, there were consumer formats, 616 millimeter, 8, 8 millimeter, but the principle of film has stayed pretty consistent and video requires all these different players. A lot of the formats that we work with stopped being manufactured years ago. And so we have to make sure that we take good care of them and tune them up, clean them, because a lot of the parts and players are getting harder and harder to come by, and so are the people who actually work on them. They're a dying breed, if you will. In some cases, people thought they were creating preservation copies by putting um, film onto videotape. In fact, that was that was not a great a great a great idea. Film is actually quite stable. The thing about older media types like film and negatives is that they are stable. Thirty years from now, you're going to be able to view them. Hundred year old nitrate film, in some cases, is still around and looks gorgeous. Rosie Video, for its manufacture, had a completely different different purpose. It was more of a kind of uh, democratizing um, format for shooting. It was a lot cheaper than film, so not only were professionals using it, but also amateurs and just the average person was able to buy videotape and record. There was plenty of access. You could watch your, your VHS tape of a film, but now that VHS tape needs a lot of help. We have to keep up. We can't just sort of settle back and say, okay, we're finished. Despite the fact that we're working with old materials that have their fixed content, the way we view that material, the way we store that material is going to just keep changing and evolving. A lot of the time, videotape is capturing real people doing real things. That might sound personal and boring, but it really encompasses so much of Seattle and Seattle's history that it's valuable to the general public and great for them to be able to access it. The public is able to see files digitized at MePOPS on Internet Archive where we create collections for each group so that they can, based on that institution, go in and view the content on their personal computer. Benjamin Schultz Figueroa. I'm an assistant professor of film studies at Seattle University, and I've been invited to introduce the program Analog Animals, which is part of My Pops and Northwest Film Forum's virtual moving history series. Uh, one of my primary areas of research is the representation of animals on screen, and I thought for my introduction I'd just sort of kick us off with some basic questions that scholars like myself are thinking about when we're talking about films and videos like the ones you're about to watch. Hopefully this will give you some new ways of considering uh, and thinking about what you're about to see. So let me start with the concept of animal magnetism. 
animals were among the very first subjects to be filmed, and there's a reason for that. We are fascinated by animals. Looking closely at animals is a pleasurable and exciting experience. And part of that fascination has to do with animals as other or alien forms of life, animals as experiencing the world both like us and unlike us in important ways. This sets up animals as a kind of mystery. What are they thinking? Are they even thinking? Why do they behave the way that they do? What explains their actions? These questions sort of surround our observations and enhance and charge our observations of animals. In the early days of television, when all programs were being broadcast live, living animals were thought of as a great attraction for shows to feature because they were so unpredictable and thus interesting to look at. Even though they didn't follow a script and in fact could be quite destructive or <laughs> uh, disruptive um, by say biting the host, Animals were spontaneous, and that spontaneity made for good television, highlighting the fact that you were watching another life form react in real time on the screen. So one thing to pay attention to as you watch today is just your own interest as a viewer. How do these films and videos elicit that interest? How do they frame their animal subjects in a new way or make you um, interested, pique your interest um, in some, some fashion? So again, that's one way of thinking about what we're about to see, uh, just the way in which animals are fascinating on-screen subjects to look at. But here's another angle that you might take. Animals have a complicated and interesting relationship to history as it's usually conceived of. And so one thing you might think about is these animals as historical subjects. Animals are often written off as ahistorical. When you watch most nature documentaries, animals are de usually depicted as outside of history. Um, living unchanged or circular lives, but not given to the ebb and flow that you, makes up human history. A wood finch from today is pretty much assumed to be the same as a wood finch from the 1970s or a wood finch from the 1870s. But what's remarkable about the films you're about to watch is that as home movies or amateur movies, they are often about the lives of individual animals as they live the, these lives in a particular time and space. Unlike a Nova documentary about animals in the wild, here we see mundane, individual animals in all of their specificity. We see Matsushita's cat, Aiwao, enjoying a day in the backyard in 1938. We see the 90-pound dog Queenie taking a flight over the Alaskan wilderness in the 1960s. We see individual animals from the Woodland Park Zoo as it changed throughout the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. In the different formats of film and video you're about to watch, you're going to get an image of animals as woven into history rather than separated and outside of history. Okay, one final framework or way of considering these animals uh, is to think about animals as important political and cultural subjects. Whether we're describing the history of colonialism in the Pacific Northwest, or extinction and extraction practices, or animals' effects on climate and global health, animals are often at the heart of massive political change Right now, with COVID-19, we are all having our lives turned upside down by a zoonotic disease that was produced through the destruction of animal habitats and changes in biodiversity. As products, spiritual entities, or political symbols, animals have always been a major part of our political and cultural discourse and have the capacity to upend and transform the world around us. That history, the history of animals as political mediators, signs, and resources is also an essential part of the moving image history you are about to witness. Okay, that's it. I hope you enjoy the program and thanks for tuning in.
Does this look like a beaver to you? Well, it doesn't to me either, but we'll find out what it is in a moment, because this is Zuperade. <laughs> Each week at this time from the world famous Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago, where today our subject is a visit to the Pacific Northwest, including a visit to the fine Seattle Zoo. And here to start you on your visit is Marlon Perkins, director of the Lincoln Park Zoo. Hello there, I'm glad you could join us again today. Well, Jim Herbert's told you a little about our coming visit today to the great Northwest of the part of the United States. I think this is going to be a very interesting and exciting visit because this is an interesting and exciting part of our country. Let me show you where it's going to be. Go up to the map here and I'll show you that this, the storyline today goes right up the Pacific coast of the western part of this country from central California clear up to Alaska. And our trip will take in some of the beautiful territory of Alaska and uh, show some of the, the, uh, the largest carnivore in the world, the great brown bear. We're also going to show something of the fine Seattle Zoo in, uh, in uh, Seattle, Washington, which I visited just recently. Jim, what was that question you had a little earlier? Oh, it was about the animal we saw at the beginning. They, they called it, I guess, a beaver, but it didn't look like one to me particularly, and I thought maybe it was misnamed. Well, it, it, it is kind of misnamed. Let me show you what it is, Jim. I'll take the microphone and go over here to this cage where this fellow lives. He's called a mountain beaver for, for want of a better name for him because he isn't really a beaver. Could you possibly turn around over on this side? Don't do any biting now. Yeah, I can hear your teeth going. Lewis and Clark were the first white people to know about this particular beaver. And the Indians called it a suelo, or a shotel, or a squala, which was their name for this beaver who lived in the, in the, in the uh, high mountain valleys in this uh, northwestern country. He's a vegetarian and digs burrows in the ground and is more closely related to mice and rats than he is to beavers. He has almost no tail at all. And that's uh, a strange thing for an animal that is called a beaver, and one that's as uh, aggressive as this little fellow. He is just turning around here and trying to bite. You turn around and face the camera, because that is the place for you to look. Jim, these little fellows uh, are found in a very narrow strip here, just along the coast from Washington, right down through Oregon, and California to about central California. And so within the span of my hand is the territory uh, the, of these animals in the whole world. What they're keeps them right there? Well, Jim, they stay there because there are mountains nearby and they can't get across the mountains. Jim, one of the rarest animals in this whole great Northwest territory is one of the rarest animals in the world. Benny shot pictures of them. Those are the, are the great otters that live in the ocean. And uh, they're, they're the sea otters. And he, in order to find them, he had to first go up by boat way up into the Aleutian Islands. In the Aleutian Island area, the sea otters uh, now live in small colonies, but originally they were considered extinct. That is, they, we thought for a time that the sea otter was gone. They have come back, however, in recent years. And here we see one lying on a kelp bed, more or less relaxed, and they follow the kelp. Uh, he's on a little island. You can see the hind feet are webbed, and they're the ones that propel him along. Fellas, maybe you can sneak up there and get a good shot, a good close shot. Oh, I think he saw me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, up he comes, alert, attentive. They're very wary animals because they've so been, been so mercifully slaughtered for their fine pelts, which is one of the greatest pelts in the world. So they're like wire-haired otters. Yeah, they have a kind of a grisly appearance around the face there, don't they? Like wire-haired dachshunds. Uh-huh. Well, he's going to lie to back down there again and take it a little bit easy because this is... Uh, he thinks maybe there isn't any danger after all. Those fellows aren't in sight, but... When they go into the sea, they just 
come down to the edge and roll over, and when the next wave comes up, slide gently off into the water. Mm. They swim with their hind feet, and they carry their front feet up where they can scratch themselves <laughs> and where they can hold their food. The sea otters have come back onto places like the uh, small pod of otter onto the coast of uh, California at Monterey. And there uh, have been larger numbers in, in uh, the Aleutian Islands. Recently, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service captured uh, three of them for the National Zoo in Washington. They were held in the Seattle Zoo, and I'd like to have you see them right here in the Seattle Zoo as they were resting on this long trip from the Aleutians to Washington, D.C. They're young otters, Jim, and here again you have a chance to see some of the characteristics that they displayed while they were uh, visiting at the Seattle Zoo. I think I saw their pictures in the newspaper and in uh, Time and Life magazine, didn't they? The yeah, one? yeah, they're just this week. You've hey. probably seen them since they've been in Washington. And Billy Mann's got them out there now. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. and they're the only otters in captivity any place at the present time. There may be others for other zoos later on. They take life easy. Yeah, you see, one of the characteristics of these otters, Jim, is that they, they will lie on their back quite a bit. And their chest, then, is something that is very interesting to them because the chest, which they, they keep clean and which they scratch and uh, rub around here, those, that's the place where they store their lunch. It's kind of a, a luncheon table, you might say. When they dive for sea urchins or crabs or oysters or something of this sort, they hold that on their chest until it is ready to... Uh, until they, they finish eating. Those are wonderful so, pictures you took. Yeah, around. aren't they grand? Yeah. Well, this uh, all happened during my visit to, to the Seattle Zoo. And this is in Woodland Park. And so locally it's called the Woodland Park Zoo. I know, Jim, yeah, I don't came I? in there uh, with a group of school children. <laughs> yeah, that's me. And uh, carrying my cameras. And as the children went off to the exhibits with their teacher, I walked up to the administration building to see the director of the zoo. Ed jo uh, Johnson, who came out to greet me with a friend. Well, look who's <laughs> here. Well, how do you do? You remind me of Dum Dum. We oh, have yeah. a white-handed gibbon in uh, our collection, too. Isn't she sweet? Certainly is. Well, they have a lot of monkeys there, Jim. And here's the place where the, where the Monkey Island uh, is and where the rhesus monkeys uh, live. They have all kinds of trees and limbs to jump up and down on. People can go clear around this exhibit on three sides and see the monkeys at very good advantage from nearly anywhere. Oh, boy, don't they have fun. Right outdoors with water moat, all kinds of rocks. Bobo lives in this zoo, too. Did you ever hear of Bobo the gorilla? Oh, is that Bobo? This is Bobo. Bobo is coming about four years old now. He weighs <laughs> now about, <I> see him. <laughs> 65, about 85 pounds. And is a fine, fine fellow. He was raised uh, as a pet in a home in the northwest part of this country until he got so big that he was tearing up the house. And then they thought the Seattle <laughs> Zoo was the place for him. Looks like you was Sinbad back in the old days when Sinbad was about that He size. reminded me of Sinbad and of Irvin Young and of Lotus and of Raja, uh -huh. the four that we have here. But look at that face. Uh -huh. Isn't he a fine fellow? Uh -huh. Oh, boy, and so gentle. We played all morning. We had more fun. Of course, his idea of play, you know, is to see if he can bite out some hair. The children are on their way out to the deer paddocks, where the Seattle Zoo has a fine herd of Axis deer from India. You see, that, that's the one that has the spots throughout mm -hmm. life, Jim. Oh, it doesn't lose them. When no, it doesn't, there. no. And uh, they had this fine buck was a uh, headman of his herd. A great herd of uh, animals that, uh, uh, well, I think they must have had 20 of these Axis deer in that one paddock. See. And the kangaroos had a new house that uh, had windows right uh, on one side where the visitors could come and look right through the window at the animals. They lived there on rainy and cold days. Mm -hmm. They also had a big outdoor yard. They had kangaroo, wallaroo, and wallabies all together in this uh, one exhibit. And so you could have a chance to make fine comparisons oh, size, between uh, all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Active, interesting, jumping around. The bear pits are some of the best I've ever seen. 
moated units with artificial rock in the background and fine specimens. Jim, look at that Himalayan bear stand up there, so begging like the for peanuts. Benny's pictures. Isn't he, isn't he fine? He with a great it. white uh, so chevron nice. on his chest there. And the Kodiak bear, boy, he's a dandy. In fact, they have a pair of them here. And the male is something. He stood up full height, Jim, nearly 10 feet, and seemed to say, hey, kid, how about a peanut my way? <laughs> is that what he said? You know, every bear <laughs> seems to have some kind of a trick to attract peanuts. Surely do. The polar bears like their food in the water. And so they put on the fire hose and start the water going and move the food around on the surface. And when they see it, old man polar bear goes after it right in the water. And that means in the water. Slides right in. Isn't that great, Jim? That's White good. as they can be, happy, in the water, cool. The native black bear uh, was standing up begging for food, too. And like uh, many of the animals, you know, the farther north you get, the bigger they get. And so the black bear in the northwest are the biggest of all, except uh, one little group in Florida. I don't know why that is. You know, down Florida are bigger than yeah. Jim, these are some Kodiak bears that were destined for the, our sister zoo, the Brookfield Zoo. Oh, coming out here. And they were being rested at the Seattle Zoo, just like the otters were rested. Mm -hmm. And so I had a chance to see pictures of them, uh, see them, and uh, shot a few pictures, too. These now can be seen at the Brookfield Zoo near Chicago. And they'll grow up eventually to be great big things. Well, that's the story. Uh, the end of our visit to the Seattle Zoo, and I, I know that the people there are very proud of it, and I hope you'll visit it when you go to Seattle. Well, Mom, there's one animal that we saw kind of fleetingly last week that I think is from the Pacific Northwest, too. I think we can see a little bit more of it this week, maybe. Huh? The black-tailed deer? Yeah, the little fawn. Let's go. Let's go over to the black-tailed deer and see this fellow over here, Jim, the young one that uh, Ed sent in to us to have a representative to show you here. And, Jim, here is a, a bottle, and if you're hungry, kid, you can have a bottle and just help yourself. Can you catch it over here? So yeah, you want to hold it right there, Jim? She can knock it out of your hand if you don't hold it tight. Got a good Move it a little away from the corner there now. Oh, 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 oh don't fall careful. out. That's yeah. the girl. This is a little different than our oh, white-tailed deer. She's got bigger ears, hasn't she, than the white-tailed deer? Uh-huh. Bang! Hey, she's hungry. She's strong, isn't she? She certainly is. Uh -huh. And hungry. Beautiful, too. Isn't she going great? Well, Ed Johnson, she's doing fine here. And um, thanks very much for a great, great trip out there. Boy, and we isn't... certainly enjoyed it ourselves, too, Marla. Survival of the salmon has always meant more than just food for the Indian people. The Indian has long recognized that if they are to survive, and if their children's children are to survive, it will be because the salmon survives. It is their legacy. There are lessons to be learned from the indigenous people of this land who have managed the salmon resource for thousands of years, and whose ancestors knew a time when salmon existed in such incredible abundance that it was said you could walk across rivers by stepping on their backs. From the river mouth to the mountain slope, salmon filled the watershed, providing food and nourishing the circle of life. Every fall, the cycle continues as Pacific salmon come home to spawn in local creeks, rivers, and hatcheries, including the Seattle Aquarium. How many of you know that this aquarium is the only aquarium in the entire world to have a fully functioning salmon ladder? It's very special. Every year, 60
52,000 chum, 36,000 coho, and 3,000 Chinook are released to come back years later. That's very special. In keeping with its mission to expand knowledge, inspire interest, and encourage environmental stewardship, in 1992, the Seattle Aquarium devoted a month to showcasing salmon and teaching ways of living in harmony with our aquatic habitat. In 1993, a major event was born as the tribal communities of the Pacific Northwest, the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and the Seattle Aquarium Society joined forces with the Seattle Aquarium to present Salmon Homecoming, a celebration of salmon, a tribute to life and to the firm belief that all things are connected. Each September, Salmon Homecoming celebrates the cultural, spiritual, and economic significance of salmon to the Pacific Northwest. More than a four-day festival, Salmon Homecoming is a gathering, 35,000 strong and growing, of people young and old who share a reverence for nature and an understanding that the survival of salmon is up to us. We cannot continue to do what we've been doing out in the ocean. It has to change our Pacific Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean is gone. We cannot do that here. We have to make some kind of commitment that that will never happen on the Pacific Coast. At Salmon Homecoming, the commitment begins with the Watershed Resource Forum, where people from all walks of life join state and tribal dignitaries to work together on solutions. The commitment to salmon is expressed in many ways and in many voices from the opening ceremonies. This event is really a tribute to the aquarium's leadership in environmental education and in diversity and symbolizes our department's commitment to serving all of the communities. Now, I will do my part. I'm going to do my part in this partnership, and all of you have to too, and including your kids to arts and crafts for kids taking place inside the Seattle Aquarium, and educational displays outside in Waterfront Park, to Native American dances and ceremonies. I thank all of you for being here. Remember this, there will be other days, other times, but this you will always remember. And a three-day powwow on the piers. Salmon Homecoming wouldn't be a festival without food and dozens of booths filled with crafts. There's even a salmon fun run and walk along the Seattle waterfront. Salmon Homecoming is more than a celebration of salmon. It is a celebration of life and of the return of people everywhere to the land. Salmon Homecoming is a statement made by Native and non-Native people of the Pacific Northwest who are committed to the restoration of our watersheds and the building of bridges, recognizing that there is wisdom in the ages and that the words of the indigenous people who have lived here from time immemorial must at long last be heard. In the ancient language of this land, I have said to you, it is indeed the time to rejoice when the salmon come home. Through shared stories, music, song, and dance, the message of Salmon Homecoming is this. The philosophy that nature is something to be conquered and overcapitalized must give way to an understanding that we are part of nature and we share the responsibility to care for it for the sake of our descendants. We have all had enough of sad tales of salmon. We want to create a story that 100 years from now, perhaps, some group of adults will gather to celebrate Salmon Homecoming and will tell of us, they were not great people, but they did great work. They saved our watersheds, they saved our salmon, they saved themselves. The Seattle Aquarium, the tribal communities of the Pacific Northwest, the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and the Seattle Aquarium Society invite you to join this celebration of salmon, to permit yourself to be inspired by it, and to use the experience to help build a better tomorrow.
<laughs> nice to see you. Do you know you're on the air? Am I on the air? Well, I'd rather be on the air with you than anybody I can think of. <laughs> Wonderful day. Should be a celebration for all the work you've done, Hazel. The envelope, please. Chevron Oil Company wins the Most Able to Clean Up the Ocean Award. If the Seattle area celebrants at Earth Day 90 had given a prize to the most recognizable environmentalist, the winner going away would have been 92-year-old Hazel Wolf. Now, I might have to frame this initiative now that you've signed it. Over the years, Hazel Wolf has signed hundreds of petitions. This great-grandmother was a fighter for the environment and a host of other causes long before the first Earth Day. I think I was born fighting the establishment. And I was told that I tried to bite the doctor when he smacked my behind to start my breathing. She grew up in Victoria, British Columbia, then is now a rather formal town. I was concerned with the restrictions they put on girls, young girls. You know, they put you into high heels and long dresses, and I battled those things. I remember the high heel business. My mother sent me off to school with these high heels, and, and as I passed the woodshed, I suddenly got an inspiration. I went in the woodshed and cut up both the heels with an ax. In high school, Hazel earned a reputation as a champion swimmer. She hasn't lost her love of water. She still swims regularly and kayaks occasionally. She came to Seattle in 1923 and found work as a legal secretary. If the bus gets in the way, we're going to roll right over again. We're going to roll by you, yeah, no. During the turbulent 30s, Hazel's rebellious spirit led her to become a union organizer and for a few years, a member of the Communist Party. I guess about 10 years later, I was arrested uh, for deportation and charged with uh, belonging to an organization that was trying to overthrow the government by force and violence. After a long court battle, she was allowed to remain in the U.S. By then, she was better known as a bird watcher than a Bolshevik. I had friends who were in the Audubon Society who urged me to join, and I became more active in the Audubon Society. Maybe the Audubon Society is the bird union and all the other organizations along with it. We have to fight the battle for the birds. I like to get out in the wilderness or at the beach or into a nice park like this get in touch with Mother Earth, it recharges your batteries. But we get up to the supermarkets and all the pavement and everything else, we get away from the Mother Earth. So we need to get back, that's our, that's our original home, you know. Hazel still backpacks with her grandchildren, recharging her batteries in every season of the year. What was I supposed to talk about? Old girls, okay. I wasn't quite sure, I need a secretary. Her speaking schedule would run a teenager ragged. I was born in the dark ages. There were no electric lights, no Coleman lamps or flashlights. It wasn't all bad. In 1898, there were no automobiles. I pledge allegiance to the earth and to the flora, the fauna, and human life that it supports. A week before Earth Day, Hazel arrives at the University of Washington to plant a tree and the seeds of action. Now well, here's a chance to do something useful. Recently, a bill was introduced in the House of Representatives H.R. 4492, known as the Ancient Forest Protection Act of 1990. It has many sponsors of representatives of eastern states, but so far none from the western states where the forests are located. We need to write to our representatives to sponsor this bill. If Wolf has a current priority, it's saving the old growth forests of the west. Our opponents say that 
All we care about is the owl, but this is not true. There should be a, a government program to retrain logging people, woodworkers. There should be assistance given to these communities to start up alternate enterprises to provide jobs. Just a lot of things can be done. But Wolf's concerns are global in scope. She's made several trips to Nicaragua to observe the Sandinistas' environmental programs. They had programs for um, saving the topsoil from being eroded and blown away. They had other alternate forms of energy, uh, solar, biomass, wind, uh, geothermal. All of the things that we're advocating that we do in this country were being carried out there by the government as government policy. I had a feeling it was the only country in the world that had that sort of program as government policy. Where are you, Hayes? There she is. <laughs> you, have, you have to keep, you have to watch quickly and sharply to know where Hazel is because she is sometimes in, uh, in El Salvador, Nicaragua. <laughs> Nicaragua is the subject of this meeting of Seattle's Gray Panthers. There are quite a few American firms there. In the gas stations was Exxon. And oh, weren't they embargoing? <laughs> Boo for Exxon. <laughs> yeah. Was that the only Shell. one? Shell. Yeah, and Standard, Pretty. all of them. But were they selling gasoline to the Nicaraguans? Mm -hmm. I thought we embarked on all that. Well, I don't know how they get around it. You know, these big corporations are pretty wily. <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. There are a lot of birds need watching. <laughs> <laughs> no, some of them are too like it. After the meeting, Hazel offers advice on other subjects. What are you people talking about so earnestly? The transportation facilities that we don't have. The transportation uh, the problem that older people have in getting about. Mm -hmm. I think it's skateboards. <laughs> At 92, environmentalist Hazel Wolf says she no longer feels like a voice in the wilderness. They're organizing all over the world. It's become a number one priority. I feel very hopeful with this kind of activity coming from all over the world and from all classes of people that we'll be able to do something to save this planet. Finally, our subject offers some tips for a long and active life. I think I live simply. I hate to cook, that's one of the reasons. So I never have any rich food. Um, for dessert, I like an orange, because I don't have to cook it. If I want to go in a cooking binge, I make jello. And I don't have a television. One of my airplanes, after, after a while I got my own airplane and uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, this is uh, just showing out <clears throat> the temperature here. I think it was around 40 below, 35 below it said and uh, come out to get the airplane ready to fly, pull my wing covers off. It take, takes a little bit to get an airplane ready to fly when it's this cold. This is a Stuart Warner engine heater. They used these in World War II. And um, I would have to uh, put heat on the airplane for at least 30 minutes, 40 minutes to warm up the oil and get it ready to go. And uh, you have to stand there and crank it, but it's it's uh, kind of a good idea anyway because that's live heat you're putting in there, and you there's always a certain fire danger. Finally, we got it ready, but here here's my old buddy. She'll come and jump in, and she's ready to go wherever we want to go. 
She weighs 90 pounds, so she's a pretty big dog. This is a 90, 90 horse cub, PA 18, 1958 model. <clears throat> this just shows you a little bit of airplane operation. What we're showing you here is the area that Queenie jumped out of Cliff Hudson's airplane. Queenie jumped out at about 800 feet and landed on a side hill and was there for five days before Cliff could come back and get her. But anyway, that's the area. And here she is, she's just, we're harassing some moose for the moment, just trying to get some pictures. These are down on a, on a river, frozen river. Now this just shows you what it looks like coming in for a landing. We're coming in for a landing on that spot right ahead of us. And this is, that's what it looked like from inside. This is what it looks like from outside. So this is just, just another day on the trap line. 